Hello, everybody. I'm Rachel Phillips Buck, VP for Student Success for Ferris Resources. I'm just waiting for everyone to join. I'm joined to that today by Mr. Anthony Melcury. Hello, sir. Hello, young lady, my favorite person on the planet. How are you? I'm good. I'm so happy to spend time with you. I'm just looking at all of our people joining. Allison, good to see you. Todd, I'm so happy to see you. These are lots of clients and people that we've known for many years. Vlad, hello. Um, you guys are doing such good work. I'm so glad to be able to spend a little bit of time with you, especially given all the busyness of what's happening in the school year right now. Um, okay, Anthony, let's start with our fun. So I have pictures <laughs> and I have 20 questions and I just, I'm, I'm like at the bottom of the barrel in terms of embarrassing pictures of me. Okay. So I've had to like, like they're just getting more embarrassing. Cause at first I was like, that one's not too bad, but I'm, I'm running out of them. Okay. okay. So here's the first one. This is you. Yeah. That, that, that was Harry. That was Harry. <laughs> you want to talk about Harry? This is me. Oh my God. This is middle school when my mom was bored and she thought it would be a good job, to, a good idea to give me a perm. Yeah, that, that, that is an interesting photo, my friend. <laughs> that is interesting. So now it is out there for all to see. Um, I have another one of us. Okay. Well, I like that one. Uh, I, I, that one's better of you. I like that one. This is and when that I was one, in charge. Yeah, that one when, when I was about 12 pounds. And <laughs> I was probably um, not, the glasses were bigger than my chest. Yeah. Um, the, the, I was probably, I'm going to guess 12. Is this like family vacation? Um, actually, my mother's boyfriend um, had a hotel in Florida, you know, kind of a two, three star hotel. And it was probably at that hotel. Um, and that's kind of where I decided to go in the hotel business. And um, so, yeah, that, that's probably in Florida. Well, I love that because as Matt and I were talking about that picture, I was like, this combination of like you at the hotel and me, this is me at a camp where I was a counselor for a long time and then a director like invested in student success even then. It's such a great like, look at, here's, here's two career paths that we chose. So that oh, was yeah. not as embarrassing. That's when I was in charge of my hair, just to be clear. <laughs> well, um, now I'm in charge of my hair. My mom <laughs> gave me, my mom gave me a bowl cut. <laughs> and then here's the last one. This is what it'd be like if we went to prom together. Oh, wow. We went to prom together. Does everybody know? <laughs> you can make anything real these days. Uh, yeah, online. that's yeah. funny. Yeah, that's my, I think there was a junior in that, in that picture. Okay. First 20 questions. Are you ready? I'm always ready. Okay. What was your first pet? A cat, Mackie. I'm allergic to it. We had to get rid of it. Oh, that's a very sad story. Okay. What was your first school? First school, mm -hmm. PS 209 on Coney Island Avenue in Brooklyn. Who was your first? Tony Danger went to that school too, by the way. And my high school, Sheepshead Bay, uh, Larry David went to that school as well. Really? Yep. And um, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg went to Madison High School, which I used to wrestle against them. And I had a couple of girlfriends that went there. That's exciting. Uh, Alicia Keys went to my elementary school. Oh, really? Where so, was you that? Know, it was in, it was PS 116 in Manhattan. But, oh, you know, wow. it's, there's a lot of talented people around there. Yeah. Okay. What's, what was your first memory? Um, <laughs> it's, not, it's not a good memory. It's the, uh, I was two years old. My dad passed away um, on New Year's Eve, 1968. Okay. What is the first record you ever bought? Billy Joel. What is the first movie you ever watched in a movie theater? The one I remember is Sting. Oh, that's fun. Uh, first sport you ever played? Uh, baseball. First job. Uh, first job was paper boy. I sucked at it. Then I worked in Dunkin' Donuts at 13 years old um, and uh, swept floors. Okay. First concert you ever went to? Billy Joel. First scar. Uh, my brother knocked me into. Well, actually, it's either my mother hit me with a shoe because I put the car in drive at eight, or which is right here. Or my brother knocked me into the wall when I was going into the kitchen to get something to eat. And that scar's right here. How, how old were you when that one happened? Do you know? This one, I think this one happened first. I was like eight. And this one happened maybe right after that when I was Siblings. 
No, I ain't. Yeah. And, and my mother yelled at me because my brother denied it. She goes, you're clumsy. I was like, well, I wasn't clumsy. He put his foot <laughs> up and I, I went into a wall, but okay. We'll just let it go. <laughs> okay, first car. Oh, 1970 Nova. I pri- I bought it for $200, borrowed money from Howie Crystal, my friend, um, and painted it um, uh, primer gray. And I put a bunch of Smurfs in the front window. <laughs> that is a surprise to me, Anthony. I did not know that. I was okay. broke. <laughs> first vacation that you remember? Florida, Disney World. Okay, first broken bone. I fell off a ladder last year and broke, shattered my ankle and all the bones came out. Last year? Uh, yeah, a year, year and a half ago, yeah. Wow. I was, oh, you didn't know that? Yeah. No. Yeah, I have, I have 22 pins in my ankle. Oh, gosh. Well, you waited a long time to break a bone, so I guess finally when it happened. Yeah, I, I came home from happened. Europe. I was tired. I got up on the ladder to chase a squirrel. Uh, squirrel ladder one, uh, foot lost. I'm so sorry. No, but I, I, but I, I'll tell you, I, I, I healed. I healed it right. I, I had a great doctor, a lot of rehab. Well, not that much rehab, but and went right back up to lifting weights. And actually, uh, deadlifting actually helped my ankle. Apparently, my doctor said. Oh. So as soon as I can get back to lifting, I lifted and it, I'm fine. As a matter of fact, it's funny you ask that. One night since then, since I really rehabbed it, have I had pain? That was the other night. It's the only night I was up all night because of pain in my ankle. Wow. I'll tell you that, it's basically perfect. That's pretty amazing, actually. Um, your first trip post-COVID? Las Vegas, last week. And I was very jealous of you because it looked like you had a lot of fun. So I'm I did have a lot of fun, and I was safe, out. and I got two negative COVID tests, so I am Good. I safe. Um, the first food you hated? Oh, um, basic training, come off a bus from New York City, uh, getting screamed and yelled at, getting into the chow hall, feeling really, really dizzy. And they put mashed potatoes with this Army or Air Force gravy that smell to this day. If I smell it, I will faint. Uh, And I almost fainted. Somebody grabbed me. And so brown uh, Air Force gravy. Cafeteria (laughs) gravy. That is very specific. Okay, two more. The last time you were really mad. Last time I was really mad. I'm glad, glad this is going to be hard for me. Um, uh, well, I'm really mad what's happening in our country. But um, I would say um, last time I was really mad. Hey, that's a I, can't rem- I can't remember. Yeah, that's a really good sign. We'll take it. Okay. And then the last time you had ice cream. Oh, um, uh, last week. And I'm going to have some uh, right after my four o'clock. <laughs> it's on the agenda for today. Well, thank Vegan you. ice cream. I can't have regular ice cream. Um, all right. Let's move into our content. So I got to do a state of the union. And then I want to talk about connected campus. Um, just in terms of like, this is a really important thing always, but especially in the middle of COVID, it's really important to think about how you can be connecting your campus. One really thing about the state of the union is it's not different. Like we're in it. Things are not changing. So August 24th, This is kind of what it looked like last time we met was the 22nd. Things were pretty much solidified and then it has not changed since then. The next big thing that is happening for our schools is that they are deciding whether or not in November, they are either, um, they've accelerated classes so they're sending everyone home and school is done in November or in November, they're sending everyone home and moving to online or they're gonna send everyone home for Thanksgiving and then come back and keep doing online. So I'm doing a poll to see kind of where everyone falls. It's like the majority of you guys are moving on your classes online in November. So you won't have students back and then you'll just have a really long break that goes all the way until the beginning of the semester in January. Some of you are um, just continuing to do a normal class. But is anybody actually not going to school in the second semester and just going online until next year or so no? Like, has anyone, um, you can chat that to us. If you, if your school has called it, like we're online until fall of 2021, which I think there are some schools in California that have done that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd be really curious to hear that. So, so are these being answered as we speak? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I also just want to take a side note as we talk about the State of the Union. Anthony, you and I talked about this last time, and that's about burnout. And I want, I think it's really important just to take two minutes in the middle of us talking about a connected campus and define what burnout means. Because when I read, I I feel like burnout's like a, hey, we know what burnout is. 
And then when I read what it is, I was like, hey, that's really, really helpful for me to understand what's going on um, in my life and the lives of so many of our clients. So feeling overwhelmed and exhausted, feeling cynical and detached from your work, and then also feeling ineffective and a lack of accomplishment, which I'm hearing all over the country, not just from higher education professionals, but just everybody. Um, the idea of burnout is that it this work overload contributes to that. And when it's chronic, we cannot rest, we cannot recover, we cannot restore balance. So this is a place where I think everybody is finding themselves. I think it's really helpful to articulate. You had a great show today with um, a psychiatrist just about how to kind of manage some of that anxiety and feeling overwhelmed. Here are some of the things they say about being able to resolve burnout, um, relaxation strategies you guys talked quite a bit about. And the other one that I didn't put on the slide is just this language, especially for higher education professionals of a wounded helper. So we're trying to help our students, but we're also feeling the wounds and the overwhelming side of burnout. And one of the things that makes a huge difference is the social recognition of really hard work. And so I want to just hold space for one minute and say to all of our attendees and all of our clients, hey, I want to recognize that you guys have been doing really hard work while you're feeling overwhelmed and taking care of your kids and all of that stuff, also providing for your students, showing up for them, supporting them. Um, I don't know, Anthony, if you have anything to add about this yeah, idea of just you know, fighting you know, burnout. You know what's happening, it doesn't get shut off. If you look at, and we talked about today on the show, when you leave your house, say in New York, I had an hour, or when I used to fly a lot, I had an hour to get to the airport, to settle in, to get on the airplane. Then I had a couple of hours on the airplane. Then I had a couple more hours of time. I had either had to go to work or went right to sleep and started my day. So there's a lot of time for me to just, you know, zone out or do what, and, and, just, and choose what work I do or don't do. And I actually have a, uh, my own, because I think the most important thing is to set boundaries. So for myself, my boundary was when I traveled for the show and I traveled for work, I do no work unless I'm prepping for a keynote, but I typically do that before I go. Yeah. Um, so I do no work until I'm actually working. So in the airport, I don't do work. I don't respond to emails typically. I just keep that whole time to myself. So I think yeah. boundaries are important. Right now, we're, you know, if you're working from home, you're helping your children online, you're dealing with stress, it never ends. And then like you're, you're home and you say you don't have time to work out or you don't have time for yourself. So very early on in my career, I've made it, not too early on, but probably about 15, 20 years ago, I've made it a very big decision that I'm going to be selfish. And what does selfish mean? Selfish doesn't mean I'm not there for my kids or my wife or my family. Of course I am, 100% in. But when I need that 20 minutes or a half hour or an hour, like today at four o'clock, as soon as I'm done with my other meeting, I'm out for a half hour. I'm going, yeah, I'm yeah. getting my ice cream that I shouldn't have. And I'm just going and I'm going to walk on a beach and I'm done for a half hour and that's it. Now, that's the problem I think that most of us have is we don't know how to set boundaries. And you have to set the boundaries. Like we're, the psychologist was set, talking um, and she said two days a week, she sends her kid to nursery school and she feels bad about that. But if she doesn't, she saw herself getting angry and upset. And like, I, the reason I said I can't remember the last time I lost my temper is because uh, two things. One, you'd never want to see me lose my temper. Uh, <laughs> and number two, um, I do things to ensure I don't lose my temper. Yeah, I really appreciate the point that we used to have buffers built in. So I can listen to the radio on the way to work. I can write, there's these places where I have space to just be. And those things, especially if you're working from home or you feel like you have too much work to do or you're always behind or whatever, those things have kind of been stripped out. So um, I think we do have to be really disciplined with ourselves about doing, um, taking care of ourselves and setting boundaries. Okay, so I wanna tell you about a controversy that happens in higher education. And I don't know, I, I'm interested to hear from you, like what is the analogy for the hotel business? But in higher education, when we talk about a connected campus, we have academics and we have student life. So academics, faculty, provost, all those people. Then we have student life, which is like everything else that happens on campus. And then sometimes we have enrollment management and those are people who are bringing students to campus. And a lot of times those three things are in silos and they don't talk to each other and they don't know what's happening with the other person. And there's some um, conflict and friction between those three areas. I don't know what that would be in hotels. Do you have like silos? I mean, I assume oh, yeah. you let that oh, yeah. exist. Oh, 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 absolutely. 
Um, matter of fact, when I'm in front of a hotel audience, um, it's it's easier for me to do a keynote because I can make fun of us and they know exactly what I'm talking about. So if you're a housekeeper or running housekeeping, you hate the front desk because the front desk doesn't tell you when the checkouts happen, uh, it doesn't give you information. If you're in sales, everybody hates you because you go out to fancy <laughs> restaurants and you fly to fancy places and they don't realize how hard you're working because they just see you going to fancy places. Right. So revenue management, everybody's like, what the hell's going on in revenue management? Because <laughs> You know, the, the person that's selling groups, they won't let them sell at that rate. And they have an incentive that they have to get a certain amount of groups on the books, but they can't because the revenue manager won't give them the rate. Uh, the front desk wants to upgrade somebody. The revenue manager said, why'd you upgrade that person for free? Um, the corporate salesperson says, I want this rate for this semester or this season. And the revenue manager's like, no, we need to get a 20% increase. Um, so yeah. It, on and on and on. Matter of fact, if I've had any success in my life, um, is I brought those silos down and refused to acknowledge them. Yeah. So that is exactly, I was thinking about why we have to have connected campuses. And the reason you have to have a connected campus, I want to talk about the promise triangle. I don't know if you've seen this before, but I really love this idea that you have, um, this idea that you have the institution and it's telling your students something. It's promising your students something. Hey, when you come, you're going to be in small classes. You're going to eat with the dean. You're going to have leadership opportunities. You're not just a number, right? So they're saying something. And then you have the institution helping staff and faculty deliver on that, uh, enabling that promise. And then you have what happens between the staff and the students or the faculty and the students actually whether or not they're um, able to do that. And one of the reasons I think we're having so much trouble in this idea of connected campus ever, but especially in COVID, is everybody's stressed out. People are not feeling motivated. They're like, hey, you told students this thing, but then the institution has fundamentally changed because we're online or we don't have money or we furloughed people. And so there's a lot of struggle with how do we make good on the promise that brought these students to our campus? And I think your daughters are feeling some of that too, right? Like the, this is not exactly what we signed up for. Yeah. And I think, listen, I don't care if it's higher education, hotel business, or in personal relationships, uh, husband and wife, communications, key. It's everything. So one of my uh, uh, daughter's campuses, the president is very uh, communicates, transparent. We know what's going on. We know what to expect. And that made me feel better. I don't need a lot of meetings, but I, they were transparent. So yeah. listen, Everybody knows this stinks. This is horrible. This is seven months in, eight months in. We're still having a lot of controversy in the country about wearing a mask. It's ridiculous. But anyway, so so seven, eight months in, and people understand there's going to be change. One of the things that pe some people are doing, I found in, in my circle, is they're leaning into the lazy. They're leaning into the lazy way out, right? Now, over-communicate, over-meet, over-explain. Uh, people don't people can handle bad news people can't handle no news because then they get nervous and they get anxious and they get stressed but people can certainly handle um the, the news that you have and listen if you're if you're going to change things which you obviously have had to uh that communication again through zoom not through an email not through not through um a phone call where nobody can see each other but like if you're communicating to parents if you're communicating to students if you're communicating like even if you have to break it down into small sections but I think it's critical what we're doing. Like, even when I just saw you, I felt better. Yeah. As soon as I saw you, I was like, ah, one of my favorite people. <laughs> it's like, I, I just felt better. I and, I think, and I think that that's the key. I totally agree with you about that. I also think it's really interesting to think about the, the difficulty of a connected campus, apart from COVID, is that you've got a lot of director integrations. We've got a lot of student services. And we've got a lot of bosses that now all of a sudden have to work together. And I wanna put this out, um, I wanna talk about a hotel, but I, I want to first start with this idea that students lead really integrated lives and they don't care if you have a turf war with somebody else, like they're waking up in the residence hall and then they're going to eat and then they're going to class and then they're going to clubs. It doesn't make sense to them that like these people recruited me and these people are my teachers and these people are in charge of student life and they, aren't getting along together or they aren't talking or these kind of silos exist. So one of the ways to think about this and um, how we partner together is everybody knows somebody who's interested in what we call relative success. 
This is from this book called The Artist Community. If you guys have not read it, I would highly recommend it. It's a great book, especially now, um, as we're thinking about how do we build community online. People who are interested in relative success just want to do better than everyone else. And your success is a threat to them, even if it's not actually a threat. They just don't like other people being successful. They are like, hey, if we're apple picking, I'll hide your buckets just so I can get more apples than you because I want to win in the end. These are the kind of people that you have to make yourself very, very small in their presence so they don't see you as a threat. Those are my least favorite kind of people. Just that. Yeah, I, just I was, I was really, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Those, uh, those, those, those tend to be passive aggressive people. Yeah. yeah. And the yeah. kind of people who, like, I want to be around people who want me to be as big and successful as I can be because then we all win win as opposed to people where I'm like, let me try to not be threatened to you. Okay. Listen, listen, anybody that's talking down to you or, or is, is a negative influence, they're usually not doing as well as you're doing. That's why they're doing. I, I don't remember right. anybody more. And again, success is relative, but, but in our, you know, how we see success, anybody more successful than me, that's, that's make like is wasting time with me. Right. <laughs> You know, <laughs> like you, yeah, I'm successful. I don't have to make you feel bad. I'm in good right. shape, right? Right, so right? I would say as you guys are thinking about a connected campus, there you do have partners like this on your campus. You do have people who are not trustworthy, who do not want to partner with you, who want you to be small, who find your successes as threats. And you have to have strategies for how to kind of maneuver around that or work with those people. Um, but they're not trustworthy partners. And so I would just say to articulate who those people are and kind of understand that's something you have to do. And depending on your situation, and I know if they're your boss, you know, there's a lot of politics. I've been, Listen, I've been in business a long time, so I understand it's not simple. But one of the things that I've learned, the best thing that works for me is my brand is, can I talk to you for a minute? Yeah. Did, I, did I pee in your Cheerios this morning? Because I don't think I was in your breakfast table peeing in your Cheerios. Just tell me, why are you can, so mad? <laughs> like, what, what am I doing? And I'll usually be very humble and say, I must be doing something. I'm so sorry. How can we work better together? I rarely, I can't remember a time where it's, it didn't change. Yeah. Like, like, what's happening is emails and social media and phone call. Everybody's a tough guy. But when right. you have to talk right. to somebody straight up, everybody's a person like if you if you were on one end of the political spectrum i was on the other end of the political spectrum and we went on twitter we're gonna hit each other if we had a cup of coffee we probably yeah. would like each other that's exactly right so i have a rule that whenever i get an email from anyone that I, this has been a rule forever that i feel like is passive aggressive i call them immediately and you know what always happens i'm sorry i'm no i didn't mean that to be i wasn't trying to work because yes, you I, are. You know, <laughs> yeah, you did mean it, but now that you have to say it to me, you kind of settled down a little bit. Yeah, and telephone also, tough guys. I love telephone tough yeah. guys. Yeah, <laughs> and I also would say I like that strategy because I've worked with people like this, and the truth is you can never make yourself small enough for them to not mm -hmm. attack you. You can never be small enough. You can try really hard and do everything you can, and at the slightest hint that you're being successful, they will come at you again. And so I think that's right. I think you just have to set it straight early and be like, what's the problem? How are we gonna fix this? Great advice. I can't agree with you more. Okay, the other one is, this is a better partner. This is a person who has personal maximization success. So they just wanna be super successful. They don't care if you're successful, that's fine. We can cooperate as long as it continues to make me successful. So if we're apple picking, I'll help you move the ladder and I'll, um, we can split up responsibilities as long as I can win. You can win too, but I want to win. This is a better partner. However, I will say that this partner has a tenuous commitment to the relationship or the partnership because when things get hard, if they start to not win, they don't want to be with you anymore. They don't want to be part of the team. This is hard. We don't want to do this anymore. I don't feel like I'm winning, so I'm out. And I think we all have those partners. And I think, you know, we've said before, like um, problems before are problems now. COVID is making it more apparent. You may have team partners that will help you connect the campus as long as you're being successful. But as soon as something goes wrong, they're like, I'm out. I don't want to be part of this. We're not actually partners anymore. I'm not going to I'm not going to be in this process. So I think that's another one that's really helpful to articulate good as long as things are good. When things get bad, they're not. They're gone. Yeah. And, and those people that, that, that usually what we do is 
we forgive people too easily. And what I mean is I forgive everybody, but that's not what I mean. What I mean is that we overlook that slight. We overlook that passive aggressive email, text message, phone call. We overlook it. They didn't mean it. No, they, yeah, they did. And if they didn't mean it, then that's okay. Then you have to bring it to their attention because they're walking around pissing people off and they don't realize it. So, so bringing it to their attention is better for them. You know, I'll, lie, I'll be lying if I tell you uh, a couple of times in my career, people come to me and say, Anthony, this is how you're showing up. And I'm like, oh my God, I didn't realize I was showing up that way. Yeah. So sometimes it's, and there's been times where, I, yeah, that's exactly the way I want to show up and I don't care if you don't like it. But, but just, there's nothing that's ever going to take the place of communication and transparency simple as that most nobody gets out of bed to piss other people off no one get, is their mission to make chaos in, in an organization whether it be a business university whatever it is there, no one wakes up in the morning to make people angry they just don't they're angry and they don't realize what they're doing right. and and so so give people the benefit of the doubt by communicating to them saying to them hey you're kind of a jerk do you know that yeah <laughs> right no. I didn't your Cheerios this morning. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, the last one I want to talk about is community maximization of success. And this is, I will do whatever I can, even if it means my sacrifices so the team can win. And I thought of a hotel that you visited that this is like the epitome of community maximization. Do you know where this is? It's, it's California. I think you're muted. Or, or, oh, there you California. Go. It's California. And it's uh, it's on the hill. It's uh Mohunk Mountain. No, not Mohunk Mountain. Um I can't remember. Yeah, I know what you're talking. They, yep, Hotel Leisure. Yep, absolutely. Anthony, this is another one that makes me cry. Okay, let me tell the story of this and then you can give your color commentary as I go. This is in a town in California that used the highway used to run right past it. Um, Ashley uh, Canty is the owner. She said that this town used to have 15,000 people. Now it has 500. It used to have 109 stores. Now it has three. It used to have 10 hotels and now it has one. And this hotel has been around forever. It is like the heart of the town. Um, everybody comes to it every night for like parties and a, they have a bar and this is where you go and have all these huge events. This owner owned this hotel for 10 years. She's $800,000 in debt because of it. So you're talking to her and you're like, hey, nobody comes here. I'm really sorry. They moved the highway, but there's no reason for people to come to your hotel anymore. And she said, hey, this is the heart of our town. <clears throat> Everything happens here. Please help me because she said, you said, this isn't about you and it isn't about the hotel, it's about the town. And she said, it's bigger than me. If you can save the hotel, you will save the town. Wow. And mm -hmm. you worked so hard um, to have, so let me start with, I loved her because she sacrificed for a community win. For 10 years, she sacrificed for a community win. Right. No maintenance, no staff, like she's dying and she's like, but the town needs it. And she felt a lot of responsibility. Yeah, she felt a ridiculous yeah. amount of responsibility. And I don't know if I would have felt the same, um, but like, because it was a ridiculous amount. I, I will tell you, you picked a hotel that one, my designer, Blanche Garcia, worked her butt off. I've never she seen did. anybody work so hard. And there's a good backstory to that. If you if you remind me at the end, I'll tell you the backstory. Okay. Um, the, um, that hotel, I'd never worked so hard to figure out a plan in like almost no time. Yeah. I literally, if you ever want to say, like, I get intense on my on my set, but um, I wouldn't talk to people until I figured it out because it drove me nuts. You said, Anthony, you said in there, okay, I've got to go because now I feel like I, I, I want to die because I can't help you. Right. I got to go figure this out. Right. And, and it was exactly true. I, I sat around and anybody came in my, in my if, if, unless it was actually urgent that I had to shoot, it was like, I can't move until I figure this out because I really, because... It's easy to say for us to walk out, get a show, even make an entertaining show uh, for, for 46, 42 minutes um, uh, with selling the hotel. I can make that interesting to the audience and we can sell the hotel. Yeah. So as soon as I, and, and there, she's like, no, we got to save the town. And then my the producer said, so you're going to sell it? I go, no, I got to figure it out. She goes, well, what is it? What, what, how do you figure it out? I go, well, you keep talking to me. I have no idea. Let me go figure <laughs> it out. 
and as you saw, we fit, but all that happened was literally on time. And like, like, like as it happened, like there was nothing thought of before we got there. It was crazy. Well, I love this because this is one said, of my favorite scenes ever. It's one of my favorite scenes ever. You said, go get the town. If this is about the town, go get the town. And all the people came and you said, how many of you will help save? I think you actually said your hotel. Right? right. This is not save her hotel. This is save your hotel. How many of you will help us? So they all raised their hands and you had like a structural engineer and you had artists. I'm gonna cry, I'm gonna cry again. <laughs> it was so good. And then the next day they all showed up with their tools and with their gloves and with their plants and they fixed. And it wasn't I mean, stage. It wasn't like, hey, can you come and show up for the camera? Like those people would have killed me if I got in their way. They were painting the lobby. They were, and and I told my producer, I said, get me to town. I told you, I said, get me to town. They're like, what do you mean get me to town? So get me to town. They're like, Go we don't find have them. <laughs> to manage the town. I said, manage what? Just get them to me. Yeah. Like, I need it, to see them. It's like, like I literally was out of my, like I'm out of my mind for four days. And it's, it's because they're like, again, talk about silos. There are no silos. Right. It's like, right. I don't care. I remember, do you remember? I don't know if they're seen made it, but with the the accountant yelled at me for the for the for the or got upset about the pool table yes the bookkeeper was very unhappy with you because it was for overflow for the bar and then at the end she was bawling she was so happy right and what, what was interesting and in talking about silos is my producer wanted to handle that i heard it i was somewhere shooting something and i was like hold on cut and i went over and i said what's going on Say, like, yeah, don't worry about it. the accountant's upset about the pool table, it drives a lot of revenue, and she's upset that you're going to get rid of the pool table because you build the lobby and whatever. I said, I'll talk to her. She said, No, it's not necessary. I said, No, I will talk to her. Yes, that's and right. Because so after that, I went over to her and I, I, I tried to understand what she was talking about. And I, I, I said, Give me a shot, give me a chance, please listen to me. And I got her on my team. Right, and right. all of a sudden, I went from like I could have easily delegated to my producer and just kind of say, like, Just leave us alone. We're here to do the right thing for the hotel and discounted her, but I didn't. I brought her into my team and she was one of the most important allies I had. Yeah, and it's such a great example of how you build community connection because you do go to the person and say, I see you, please be on my team. And what I love about this episode is in the long run, her sacrifice for that town meant that all these people showed up and helped her because they were like, hey, she really is on our side. She's been sacrificing. Now we're going to give back to her and make sure that she feels the support and the love of the town. So that was one of my favorites. I think it's season two, episode four. It's a really was great it season two. Talk. Wow. It, it seemed like it was yesterday. Um, it was, um, yeah, it was a very interesting. And again, the, 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 you have to go up the hill. It takes 15 minutes to get up the hill. So unless you're going to that town, there's no reason to go to that town. Right. So, so we made it a reason to go to the town, like to make the 10 minute trip. Yeah, I want to say the two things that you did that were really, really genius. The first one was you were like, hey, you have no staff, so you're going to make it a co-op so people can have like a free night if they'll come and work one weekend every month, right? Which is great, which is, again, like community maximization. You guys want this, you know, help us. And then the other thing was the membership to the Preservation Society. So you're in a club and we're going to have dinners for you and you can have birthday and all that stuff, but it's a way to kind of supplement this. Um, this Absolutely. And, and I'll tell you, my, my, my staff was getting antsy because i didn't have any answers and i'm in my uh trailer and i'm like this <laughs> they could come in and i was like stop talking everybody stop talking it's like anthony we gotta go are we gonna sell it what are we gonna do i was like stop talking i'm stressed out stop talking i they stayed in, and i said nobody in it nobody out so a half hour and all of a sudden i went like this i got it that's exactly how it happened I was like, I got Come it. To him. I go, what do you got? He said, don't worry about it. Get, get me them, get the cameras up, go. And they go, what do you got? I said, I'm not telling you. Get the cameras, get them, let's go. And no one knew what the hell I was going to do. And you know why? Because at that point, I knew it was the right thing to do. And I didn't need anybody's opinion. Sometimes I ask my producer's opinion or whatever, my assistant, I'll call whatever. But like, it was like, no, this is it, done. Like, I, if I want your opinion, it. I'll give it to you. It's it's yeah. no. And and we, so, wow, you, you really get me a going. It's good. It was so good. Well, I, we only have like two minutes to spend on this next one, but I thought it was a good juxtaposition. And that is this crazy town hotel. You remember this one No. with sisters? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, this is another one I want everyone to watch. 
but I think it's super helpful. They, these are sisters, um, one of them works for the other. And so they had a lot of conflict. But if you talk about a connected, like talk about silos, the sister who owned the hotel never went to the hotel because she and her sister were having so much conflict that she's like, I'm just gonna pretend like it doesn't exist, right? And everything went to pot. And Anthony, you, you know, my background is a marriage and family therapist. Mm -hmm. So when you're like, I can fix a hotel, but whatever's happening here, I, we're going to get a therapist. You did, you hired a therapist to come and help them out. That's another, that's another reason I love my producers. Like get me a therapist. They're like, what do you mean? Get me a therapist. We need one in this case. By tomorrow morning, get me that. I said like, dude, like, this is not a hotel. Like I can't fix them. And like, I, like, listen, I could easily, a lot of hosts and stuff, they pretend and just for the show to get through the show, but I'm not doing it. I mean, I want to really help them. And when they started well, crying and getting to know each other better, it was, it was amazing. Well, listen, I think that you and I could do a show where we go to crazy hotel owners. I will do therapy for them. When they start crying, you can be well, like, I'm I'll, out. I'll, I'll be the first one. I'm going to call you. Next, we're probably going to get another show this year. So I'll, I'll call you. And, yeah, and, and I will come and do some therapy for them for sure. Okay. So let's talk about, those are challenges. There are challenging people. You want to be a community maximizer. I would say write that down. It's even harder now because we're in coronavirus. And so people are on campus and they're off campus and you have to take this extra effort to have a connected campus. But I do think at the end of the day, it is look people in their eyes, talk about what you need. How can you partner? How can you really invest in your community so that students can be successful? So I want to talk about some solutions for this. Some of the stuff we've talked about before, but I would just say, Anthony, you said the other day when you're trying to tell people something or explain something to them, you say it until you're sick of saying it. And then it's, you probably said it just about the round, the right amount of time. So again, this book is the art of community. These are the seven um, pieces of community. It's things like, how do we know who's in or out? How do we show them who's in or out? What do we do together? What's the space that we do that in? Um, what are our signs and stories of successes and failures? Um, how do we remember each other? And then who is the leadership? Those are all pieces that I think are super important as you're thinking about a connected campus. Um, Matt and I have done a couple of um, webinars on this. So if you're interested in that piece, get the book, watch the webinars. But I would just be saying, as you're thinking about a connected campus, those are the elements that you have to be incredibly intentional about building in so if that I, if I can interrupt you for just a second please by making a connective campus or a business you have to do it by picking up the phone and by ha having a face-to-face -face zoom or whatever what has happened is everybody sends emails everybody sends booklets everybody says here's a phone number like give an example somebody asked me today it was a question like um about if people are feeling depressed well if you have a phone number for students to call they're not calling it Okay. Unless they're really, really desperate. Okay. So if you are intentional about that is you set up meetings for those students that, you know, are having problems and you say, Hey, no harm, no foul Thursday, three o'clock. There's somebody there for you. Um, we'd love to see you get on the phone, zoom, whatever, sh show up, but no harm, no foul, but three o'clock is your turn. Three o'clock, four o'clock your turn. So it's everybody. So even if you're not having problems, like everybody, we have to be intentional. I love that. When you said that today, I was thinking, that's right, students will not call. But if I say, I'm calling you at three o'clock, answer or don't, it's okay. I got it. I, it doesn't matter to me. The likelihood that they will then take me up on that is way higher because they have an opportunity that they don't have to lift a finger. Right. And for. then you know what? Next Tuesday, they may, they may not pick it up either. Maybe Tuesday after they do. Yeah. Um, and because, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, and we know that, that an attempt for connection counts. So even if they don't pick up the phone, the fact that somebody is calling them to check uh, on them counts. Yeah. That Yeah, it, it makes them feel like they're important. And there's not one person on this earth that's not dealing with some kind of stress or mental uh, mental stress, physical stress. There's not, there, I, there's not a person alive. How do you go through a pandemic and you're not stressed out in, yeah. in some way? We all exactly. carry it differently. Yeah, I, I can't imagine it. Um, okay, the other thing that I want to say solutions to your connected campus, make sure that you're articulating the value and the vision of your institution, of your classes, of your meetings. If I'm having a meeting with students, I'm going to have the vision and the values of why I'm having this meeting because I want them to feel heard. 
because I want them to be understood. If, uh, uh, yeah, because I want to offer them resources. Why are we having this meeting? And then you line up everything that you're doing at the institution, in your classes, in your meetings to support that. And really the underlying um, purpose is that your students feel seen and under, understood. And like, you know, they're a whole person. They're not just this piece that I'm supposed to be fixing right now. I'm just trying to get you registered for classes. I don't really care what's happening, you know, in your whole, in your whole life. So that, how do we articulate that a person is a whole person and seen as really important? Right. And you know, listen, and everybody's dealing with something, right? So that person that's trying to just get you registered, you're dealing with your family, you're dealing with the, your stress. Um, you know, you have to really reset yourself. You really like, why yeah. am I doing this? Like, like you have to really, really think about why you're doing it. And uh, that's the only way to get you through. So you told a story the other day about a very wealthy man that you know who can stay anywhere um, at any hotel. They would all would be really happy to have him. And he always stays at this hotel. And you said, why do you stay there? And he said, because they remember my birthday. Mm -hmm. Mr. 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 Mickey, Mr. Mickey Miller. Yep. It's such a powerful, right? Because he's a, the hotel he's a, probably is a billionaire. He's probably a billionaire. Yeah. Yeah. And so if that hotel has not articulated their vision and values, which is, I want you to feel like we, this is home and we miss you, and we see you, and we know you, then they miss out on that. And and because they were clear on that, it was communicated to him really well. Listen, it's not the big things, it's the small things. The hospitality industry is built on small things, not big things. Um, it's it's just really, really simple. I, I think I was saying on my show, you may have heard, like when I went out to um, Vegas for meetings, uh, and they put me at the Sky Suites, the Aria, which is a five-star hotel, and I was afraid they wouldn't have these sandwiches that they usually have or these, you know, the cocktail, not cocktails, but sodas and waters and coffees and stuff. Yeah. And uh, I went in and uh, lo and behold, they had all the little sandwiches in little wrap. So nobody can touch them. Nobody can breathe on them. And um, I was like, I sat there and had my lunch. I had 32,000 little sandwiches and <laughs> they had these orange peels with chocolate. And I'll, I'll never forget those orange peels with chocolate. It's my favorite. Yeah. And like that little thing, I don't remember the big suite or the Japanese toilet, or although I do remember that, <laughs> all the other things, but I do remember those little sandwiches. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so I wanna talk about some other solutions. Um, you guys, I don't, so many of you are clients, so I know that I'm preaching to the choir, but if you guys do not have technology to make you more efficient and give you one place to see everything, I don't know how you're managing. And I know that we provide technology, but I am saying as a practitioner, I do not know how you're managing if you don't have one place where you can go and see everything. So if you cannot see what is happening with academics and with success coaching and with tutoring and with student life, I don't know how you're managing that. Um, we have a school, Juniata, that did a great job of uploading safety plans for all of their students. So they did a survey and asked all of their students, hey, if we have to send you home, what is your safety plan? Where are you gonna go? How far away do you live? How are you gonna get there? That picture um, or access to that information in one place, not living on a piece of paper somewhere where we then have to go look it up is incredibly important. And then you think about things like really quickly being able to see all of the demographic information, the last absence, the schedule, who else is working with the student. You should know who to ask and how to ask them about what's going on with your students if you're gonna see them in this really holistic picture. I just, I don't know how you're doing it without technology. You know, I've, I've said this before, but um, when I run a hotel um, early in my career, I would go like this in a meeting where's the report? Where's the report? Where's the report? And we do something now called an Oscar. I have one report. I put it down in the morning. I have all my meetings. I know everything on that report. I yeah. could not function. I could not function. Matter of fact, it usually takes two or three weeks people to put the report together. I want, I have one assistant because she thought it was crazy. I actually quit over getting me this report the right way, the way I wanted it. I was like, no, no you don't understand. If you give me this report, then you don't have to bother with me. Cause I like, I will like, this is all I need. Like just give me this report every morning and I will be a happy person. Yeah. And so I, I don't know how people function with, especially in today's day and age, when back in the day, you can call someone, a student or a client and say, I'll call you back in a couple of hours. I don't have the, the information. Everybody is on a three second timeline. I mean, right. you, you know, like if you text your children or your friend, you know who's going to text you in a minute, who's going to text you in a second. Yeah. So we're, we're not into hours. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. Yeah. We want, we need the information right now. Right. For sure. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say about that is if you are not, 
please be careful of information as well. So we need to share it with the right people, but we also need to be very careful about there's a lot of personal stuff that's happening with people. And so you want to make sure that the right people get that information and not that it's just like in a note field that everybody can access to be able to see all of that stuff. So please, I want to caution you about that. I was thinking about a connected campus the other day and I realized, you know, we've talked before about the student success funnel. I'm very bossy about this with our clients that you have to find students who need whatever the thing is. And then you have to connect with them. You have to see them. You have to make sure that you understand them as a person. And then you can solve their problems. Then you can check off whatever you have to do on the list. And then we're going to have measurements of success. And I realized that a lot of times silos exist because people are trying to solve before they are seeing their students. So like you're we saying, if I'm just trying to get you registered in classes, or if I'm just trying to get your health record, or if I'm just trying to get you financial aid, I've focused on solve instead of this idea that a person is made up of all of these different things. What's going on with you? How are you feeling? What's happening in your environment? All of these different elements make up a person. And for our kids, to be clear, we would never just say like, hey, my job is just to feed you. So all this other stuff, that's I'm not paying any attention to that. My job right now is just to get you some food because that's what I'm supposed to do. So that success funnel, if you will teach it on your campus and you will enforce, the most important thing is that students are seen as holistic people. And then we move on to how are we going to solve this problem that they've come and they've tried to, um, you know, get your, your help with. I will absolutely send the PowerPoint um, and a copy of this so that you guys can use this. I know if you're attending this webinar, you're doing this already, but there is this responsibility then to teach it to other people on your campus so they understand the importance of that. Um, this is, sorry, this is about technology. So this is the sisters and their keys. And when I saw this, I just thought, oh my word. I don't know that we have to say more about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's wrong at so many levels, right? Um, you can make you can make a copy of the key down at the hardware store and rob somebody. You can, there's so many. So, you know, the hotel business has been afraid of technology. And when they implement technology, it's usually the wrong technology. So you would think that um, seamless check-in and door locks with your phone and, and checking in online, we would have been there a couple of years ago. Yeah. Well, COVID has gotten us there now. But this was all on the docket for 10, 12 years or five years or whatever. But it's getting us there now. So now you're going to see all the big brands have all, all the same technology. But it took us forever to get there. Now, why do we have to wait to emergency for us to get there? Hilton did it before anybody else. Yeah. Why, did, why did it take, like, why should I go to a hotel and still wait in line? I mean, I think that is ludicrous. If, like, I go to a four-star a four star hotel and I'm staying in line for 30 minutes, it ain't happening. Yeah. And I will never go back to that hotel. And I think um, that technology for technology's sake doesn't matter, but technology that works and makes everything easier for the people um, that need it, especially now because everything is so um, immediate uh, and everybody's expecting it immediate. Again, we're, we're teaching children and we're managing children that didn't know what life was before technology. Right. We're of the age that we understood life before technology and we understood life after technology. But if I'm coming in, I thought, you know, my parents in the world, you know, God gave a tablet to everyone. Right. right? Well, right. well, you know, a, a computerized tablet. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think that we are at the place where our schools, like so many of our schools are having to move paperless. So like for disability services, it used to be, they had all these forms and everyone had to come in and they had to sign it and all this stuff. And since COVID, you really are seeing schools saying, Hey, we got to stop doing that because they're not on campus. This is an opportunity to move over to technology. That's going to make it easier. Even just things. I like what you said about technology for technology's sake. I have a list here under my circle of care members of everybody who's connected to the student. Here's all their faculty. Here's their advisor. Here's their success coach. If they were an athlete, I would be able to see that. Please make me more efficient. It's like we talked about last time. We're in mile 18 of a marathon. I cannot be inefficient with knowing who's connected to a student and knowing what's happening with them. So I think this is a great opportunity to say to schools, we've got to invest in technology to make us better. You and I talked about stand-up meetings the other day. I cannot stress enough 
if you want a connected campus, how much you should do 15, 20 minute stand up meetings, look each other in the eye, what's going on, what do we have to solve, what can we improve, what's happening today. I can't stress how important um, that is. And Anthony, I know you feel the same way about it. Well, and I think like, especially if it's a Zoom meeting, because everybody's not on campus, I think um, you do this, like you you make this fun, right? So, you know, you know, it, when you first did it, I like being asked rapid questions. I like that. So you did it again, you did it a couple of times and you made it fun. So as I'm entering this meeting and we're talking about serious stuff, I'm already kind of like, that was fun. I, I look forward to it. So, so having a stand up but making it fun, you know, is important just to have another Zoom meeting, have another Zoom meeting, but to make it fun, like, hey, let's share what kind of coffee we're drinking or whatever. Yeah. And then three, four, five minutes of connection, and then we're then we're into what we have to talk about. But I don't understand how you can function as, as an organization without seeing each other. Yeah. And I think it's a, the way you sell it is you say it's going to make us more efficient. I know it's one more thing right now, but I promise in the long run, it will make us more efficient. It's, we'll not, even, it's not even it's not even a question. Uh, it makes you efficient because it does one of two things. It makes you care or it makes you care less. If the meeting is if the meeting is good and engaging, you care. Right. Um, somebody did something. Somebody just said there um, somebody checked on them. Where was it? Oh, it was a meeting with a, a Marriott executive and I was out in Vegas and he said this morning, Arnie Sorensen, who is the CEO of Marriott, who's a powerful person in business, he had a check-in meeting with all his high level executives. And he said, I've been in this company 30 years and that's why I love it. They have check-in meetings with us every week and it's Arnie Sorensen, Mr. Marriott, Marriott's, Mr. Marriott's daughter. Uh, and they're having, hey, how you doing? How's the field? What's going on? This is what we're doing. What are you doing? And like, he he's a 50 year old man. Wow. And he, like, he was 12. He was so excited. I would, I would be really interested for presidents to be doing that at institutions. I would be really curious to see. I couldn't imagine not doing it if I was a president. How their perspective would change as they're looking at their. Is anybody doing it? I don't think so. It, uh, I would love to hear from those of you who have joined us if your president is doing that. And I and I think it's an important distinction, like not a once every two months, like state of the union, but a like, hey, no, how's it going? No, check in. It's called a check in, like every week or every other week, or you know, and, and not everybody has to join if they're busy. But it's like you need to. Like, I just had I just talked to somebody um, with name nameless, um, but uh, they would like a check in from you know, their boss, you know, and it's like, they yeah. haven't checked in. And I, and this is another excuse that I love that people put on me. It's like, Oh, I know you're busy. I know you're busy. I know you're busy. It's like, I'm too busy. We're busy. We're busy. We're busy. Man, everybody's busy. Everybody's okay. Busy. Let me get, give me your phone and let me see how much social media you did today. <laughs> you, had you had time to check your emails and text messages and you had checked time to check Instagram and everything else. So everybody is busy. Busy is not an excuse for, for human interaction. Yeah, that's exactly right. It looks like Katrina Rogers, the president of Fielding Graduate University, checks in with the students. So that's awesome. I would really like for more and more people to do that. Okay, Anthony, I know you have to run. Um, I'm going to stay on for just a minute and talk about um, some of the resources that we have, but I want to show you a quote that we heard for the first time two weeks ago, and then I saw it on your Instagram. Uh, do you have that about cats? Oh, where, where did you hear that quote? You said this to me. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I put you, it on my Instagram. I liked you, it so much. I liked you it. You said so it much. to me. And then the next morning I was looking at your Instagram. And I, was I was like, like nobody, go, that's my quote. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you said it here. But yeah, I, I called I call my social media uh, uh, manager and I said, hey, do me a favor, jump, put this in the, in, in the cycle of my social media. I loved it. And when you reacted to it, I was like, it's true. I'm more allergic to negative people than I am to cats. And I'm definitely allergic to cats. I really like the idea. You know how sometimes when people don't like food, they say they're allergic to it and then they like get out of having to eat it. Right. I really love the idea of being able to tell negative people, hey, I'm really sorry. I'm allergic to that. So I've got to just, I can't. I oh, can't yeah. Um, I'll break out and listen, hide. listen, I'm very <laughs> fortunate that somewhere along the line, I realized that um, I'm not letting people take control of me. It's just never going to happen. And, um, you're, you're like, like Joe Rogan says, get that negative stuff out of here. Like I said last time. Yeah, like absolutely. Just, just, because listen, you only have a certain amount of time in the day, man. And you want to be happy. I told you, 
happiness, there's a chapter in the book, in my book, it says, uh, happiness is hard, choose happiness. Yeah. And this is hard, that. man. Well, thank you for spending time with us. Like I said, I've got a couple other things to talk about, but will you give us your uh, send off? Um, be kind to yourself. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, thank you. It, always a pleasure. Let's do it again tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's do it. Okay, guys. So uh, two more things that I want to tell you about a connected campus. I love the idea of creating space for students. So anticipating their needs. If you are not using surveys, please do. We've partnered with Macmillan um, to do some really amazing surveys. They're super affordable. I don't know how else you're going to find out what's happening with, with students over the course of the next semesters. This is a way that you can identify students who are struggling and do really um, targeted inter, uh, interactions with them and make sure that you've got the right team around them in that connected campus way to say, can you manage this piece? Can you manage this piece? Can you manage this piece? Um, the other thing I would say is, I think, again, I know you guys are doing this, but I think we need to teach people how to see the whole person. Um, we do this as parents. When, when my daughter is feeling very, very cranky, I'm not just like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, oh, she's hungry. Let me feed her. And then we can get to these other things that are going on, right? So teaching people, like what I would say is I would send out this graphic of all of the things that make up a person. I would send that to everyone and I'd be like, put it on your desk as a reminder that we must see our students before we try to solve problems for them. And if you have a partner who's like, that's stupid, I don't wanna do it that's a place where you focus your energy and your time and saying, this is why, especially during COVID, it's really important for us to be assessing these other things with students. And you guys, I know you're tired. I feel the same way. Some days I'm like, I just want to sit in my office and I don't want to help anybody. I don't want to assess what's happening. I don't want to be a, be a parent today. I don't want to be a consultant today. I just want to have some space. And I think what Anthony said about setting those boundaries is really important. Please look forward to Thanksgiving. It is coming. It is going to be a time where you have some space and some time to um, be. I have started at Ferris and with our clients scheduling hour long meetings and then just having them go for 30 minutes. And then I'm like, hey, here's 30 found minutes in your day. So don't go do something else. Just sit in your office and think about what's happening um, and with yourself and take care of yourself. Remember, retention is still um, an issue that we have to think through. So please find your community maximizers, find those people who are in it for the good of the community, because in the long run, those relationships are gonna be healthy and you'll be able to lean on each other in this struggle. Schedule your daily stands up, stand ups, use technology. This is a place to kind of slip that into your budget and say, we've got to do this so that we can get more efficient with all of the work that we're doing. Ask your students what's going on and then teach others how to see students. Those are your action items. Um, as always, we have a long list of resources for you. So here is a bit.ly, you can just take a picture of this. We also have the link there for all of the tools that we've um, created for you. If you're interested in those surveys for your students, this is kind of the timeline of how that goes. There's five of them at various times in the semester. If you're interested in that, here's the contact information for iClicker, iClicker and Mandy. Um, and then uh, if you're interested in student video resources, so if you want to send out videos to students about, you know, time management and how to be resourceful and develop self-agency, please use those. We think there are lots of students who need to hear that um, language. Um, thank you guys so much for joining me. Again, please hear me say, I know you are doing really hard work. I know that you are tired. Um, but also that you're making a huge difference in your students' lives. And if we can strengthen community and we can lean on each other, uh, we actually make it easier and alleviate some of the burden that we're carrying independently. If there's anything I can do for you, or if you have any questions or any topics that you'd like um, for me and Anthony to address in the future, please send me an email. Happy to see all of my friends here. Thank you guys for joining. Have a great day.